Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out. I know it's the last talk, and it's me that's in the way of beers at the moment for you, so hopefully it won't be too painful, and then you can grab a beer afterwards. Um, so this is the agenda that we're going to go through today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about who Health Direct is, and then I'm going to break it down into two views, because so, we've got two different development teams in our um, well, in our office, we've got the infrastructure as a code team, and then we've got a traditional application team. So we're going to talk today about this as a solution as a whole, and how both teams can work interactively and embrace efficiency um, using the same tools, um, tool chain, but different ways to deploy Docker. Um, so a little bit about me, I'm a solution architect. Um, I like playing around with Docker. Everything in my house runs on Docker and Raspberry Pis. Um, uh, I like to hack stuff with Docker. It's, that's just what I do. Um, you can find me here if you want any code or tweet or my Docker images. Uh, fun fact about me, because I'm from Australia and most people probably don't know me, this uh, movie changed my life when I saw this when I was five and saw that you could take over a computer with another computer and do crazy stuff. I was like, wow, I'm hooked. And it's pretty much how I got to where I am now. Um, I'm actually going to kick off part of the live demo now, and we're going to come back to it. So I'll just escape out of here. OK, so who are we? Uh, health Direct is an organization that has online health care for the Australian public. Um, so what that means is instead of going to emergency rooms, um, people can be diagnosed with applications that will go through your symptoms and tell you where you should go, whether you go to the um, GP or you go to the, need to go to the emergency. Um, we also do one for um, pregnancy, birth and baby, where if a mother has a sick child in the middle of the night, she can hop on and click a link and get an online chat with a nurse, um, saving her to see if they have to go to the emergency room or not. Um, we've been around for about 10 years, I think. We started off as just a core service, and we moved on to an online presence. Um, and online presence has taken over now, obviously. With the way technology is going, we've got apps, we've got a whole heap of stuff that people can hook into to get healthcare service for free. Um, there's just a list of some of the, some of the sites that we um, provide. So as you can see there, we've got our main site, um, one for pregnancy, birth, and babies, one for mental health, um, a national services directory, which is a list of all the medical practitioners in Australia, um, all the chemists, all the emergency rooms, all the GPs, dentists, etc., where they are, when they're open, and how you can get in contact with them. So it's a fair bit of data in that application. Um, My Age Care, which is for caring for elderly people, and Carers Gateway is for caring for anyone with a disability. So why did we use Docker? What made us start to use Docker? Um, we had a broken CDCI process where it was, not, it was fractured that app was doing this and infrastructure as a code was doing this, and the two didn't meet. They were running parallel systems, which is kind of OK, but it's not, it's not the most efficient way to do things. Um, there was a long time turnaround on infrastructure requests. Um, at the time, we were building everything with Puppet. And so when um, an application team wanted a new version of something, that means that the infrastructure as a code team would have to do dev work to write a new puppet module to roll it out. Um, and there, that makes the process really slow. And then the infrastructure development team was spending 75% of the time upgrading applications or versions of like MySQL, blah, 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 and testing, and not actually working on the platform. So we're not actually improving any of our hosting capabilities or our platform as a service capability. We were doing more of um, just updating versions of things for the development teams. Um, so when we moved to Docker, we actually pushed that back onto the development teams. And now that they can run containers locally, they can actually do the upgrade themselves and then push it through the CD process, um, freeing up the infrastructure team to work on the platform as a service, and then make everyone's life easier from having a better um, platform to run things on. Um, so I'm going to talk about the two views now. Um, so we have, as I mentioned before, we've got two um, teams that are development teams that have two extremely different views on the world. So the infrastructure as a code team uses, um, has a whole different set of responsibilities to your general app developer that was delivering the um, websites that I had up earlier. Um, so this is what we, we wanted to do, um, deliver together. 
um, custom container images, a highly available container ecosystem, and adhere to security regulations. Because we um, deal with health, we have a lot of security um, mandates, and it has been a fun process to try to take Docker on that ride. And I will talk about some of the security stuff we do um, in the infrastructure part. So this is the infrastructure infra view. Um, so the role of day-to-day uh, -day life in the infrastructure um, dev is writing Ruby, Golang, or Puppet Lab, um, Puppet. Um, we look after all AWS resources, and we're 100% in AWS. So we've got no like, bare metal anywhere. Uh, it's all on EC2. Um, everything needs to be automated as infrastructure as code, no exceptions. There's, that's the heart of fast rule. We don't do anything that's not automated. Um, we have the motto now of containers first. Um, so as we go on, I can show you what we've put into containers. And we have the hard and fast rule that if there's no unit test on what you've written, um, the CD pipeline will fail. Um, and that's the three, the three main things our team um, strives for. Um, as I said, we're in charge of um, all the AWS resources, the container ecosystem, service discovery, Docker networking, the Puppet environment, development of all infra as a code, the CDC, CDCI um, pipelines, and the persistence of data. Um, and I'll get into the persistence of data a little bit later as well. Um, the main tools we use are Puppet, um, Docker, uh, the Docker engine, UCP, Compose, and DTR. We did use open source Swarm before, and I've been working with that since like, it was really, really new. Um, I love Swarm. And if you saw today's um, release of SwarmKit, it's one of the best things to come out. It's awesome. Um, we use Jenkins for our build server. Um, Elastic is just the interface for logging. Um, we use console for service discovery. And we use Flocker for data persistence of EBS volumes for containers that need state. Um, so it is great to use um, Docker for immutable containers, but not all applications can be immutable. And somewhere you've got to have to have state in your application. Um, if there needs to be state, we then have the option of using Flocker, um, which will extract the um, EBS volume away from the AWS instance, and the container will have its own EBS volume. Um, so if that node it's on in the cluster dies, the data is still persistent there. And when it comes up and reschedules on another node that's healthy, it takes the same data store, uh, making your data persistent. Um, the tools that we've fully migrated into um, Docker, uh, Jenkins, uh, Terraform, Console, uh, Elastic, and our Puppet build environment. Um, we actually plug Terraform into Jenkins, and it's really cool that you check in your TF file. Um, it will go through some unit tests, and then it will fire up a Terraform container, and then push the code there, do the build, um, check AWS, make sure it's OK, and then rip down the container. So you, we can do asynchronous, asynchronous builds with Terraform into our AWS environment with the power of Docker and multiple versions of Terraform running at, one, at the one time. So this is um, like a high-level flow of data of how stuff gets to the production environment or into an environment. So the Docker file gets pushed to the Bitbucket server. That's um, first, I'll just explain, for security mandates, we have to have everything in-house. And when I say in-house, that's in AWS. We can't use any um, cloud provider stuff like GitHub or any of those sort of um, SaaS products that are on, um, out there on the internet. So everything we, ha we host internally. Um, it is on the cloud, though. So we push to our local Bitbucket. Um, Jenkins built server, picks it up, does a whole heap of tests against it. Um, there's a lot of security stuff that we've just built into Jenkins. So we actually use Claire to do vulnerability scanning. Um, it's a core OS um, project. Um, so when a, a, a container gets spun up, it actually does end-to-end -end vulnerability scanning on the package levels. If there's a vulnerability found in the container, it will actually fail, fail the build. Once that's um, complete and Claire's OK, there's no vulnerabilities, we then sign it with Notary. Um, we don't accept any containers in any of our machines that aren't signed by Notary and signed by our, um, in our DTR. So if someone hops onto a machine and go docker pull, uh, the engine will not allow it to run because it's not trusted by Notary. Um, so for the infrastructure team, they will then build um, a puppet module, and that will then put the, the Docker container into the UCP cluster. So it's pretty straightforward infrastructure as the code kind of stuff. Um, 
So in our first part of the live demo, we're going to look at what the infra team would build for the development team and then hand it over to them. So as you can see, that's just still building. So I'll just log in. Um, so as you can see, we've built a three-node cluster. We've got two applications running. Um, so what I've, what I've done for this demo is we've built etcd as a key value store if they need a key value store to use. Um, I've set up interlock as an application layer server router, router for them. So if they need to put multiple web apps into this UCP cluster, they can um, map where it's going to go through interlock, uh, making it fl the flexibility and highly available. And the last thing that's just building now is they're going to have a Jenkins build server. Um, one really good thing about using UCP is if you have an operations team that are not familiar with Docker, that aren't comfortable with logging into a server and saying um, Docker PS or can't work out what's happening, um, UCP is beautiful for that because they can just come in here and they can see that we've deployed three applications with um, Docker Compose and they can see that Oh, well, Jenkins has failed. That's not good. Let's restart Jenkins. Well, that's a perfect example of seeing how quickly you can see if something fails. Let me just restart this. There you go. I don't know what happened there. Um, hopefully, we can go to now Jenkins. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened there, just a bug, but that actually happened at a really good time. Um, so if that was um, an operations team, they could have just looked at that and then go, oh, Jenkins should be running, start, and then it's up and running. Um, so if you do get anything like that that happens, see how quickly and easy that was to troubleshoot, and now Jenkins is back up. Um, so I have built into Jenkins um, an automatic C job that will now set up the container deployment for the application team as well. Um, so as you can see in it here, I've run one command. We've built all this with no hands. So it's completely re replicatable. And you've got everything in a desired state. Um, so there you go. There's the deploy container job. Um, so that was built inside the Jenkins container with the Groovy DSL plugin. And we'll get back into that. And we'll go through what it looks like from an application development team's point of view now. So just going through what we built. So we configured a UCP controller. We configured two UCP nodes. We automated all the configuration in the cluster. So that's all of the TLS, Handshake, um, everything. We've configured it to look at the Swarm API. So all the nodes talk through the one API. So if you hit the Swarm API, it will schedule across all nodes. Um, we set up a private network called Swarm Private just in case that, that, that they need it. We deployed a Jenkins server, and we're using an interlock um, for a proxy. Um, so I'll just go back, and I'll show you um, here. The Jenkins is running on UCP02. And no matter where it's running, because Interlock knows the URL here, um, the application router will, and Nginx will point me in the right direction. So no matter where my application schedules across the three nodes, um, I'll always be able to find it on the URL because Interlock's doing the um, application routing, and that's dynamic on the UCP clusters event loop. So that's what um, Interlock's looking at. OK, so now we're going to have a look at the application view. Um, one of the things that the application um, team wanted as part of a platform service is it needs to replicate production. So we needed to come up with something that we could spin up for them and spin down, um, and it'd be the same no matter which environment it was um, deployed in. The platform deployment pro process should be agnostic to the application. Um, this is really important. So if they could write something in any language or want to deploy in Docker or want to deploy in another way, um, the, the CD process has to be available for that. So if they wanted to do a, just a, a normal Maven build, because some projects aren't on using Docker yet, the process had to allow that. But then it had to also incorporate Docker if the teams wanted to use Docker. And all deployments should be automated. So again, it's a, everything should be automated rule. There should be no deployment uh, manual changes in any of the deployments. Um, 
I'm not, I'm not really going to go much into what the app teams are responsible for because we are government and I can't go into the custom build applications that much. But you can imagine they're in charge of the front end, middleware, and the data tier. Um, but they're not responsible for the persistence of that data. Um, so they're responsible for the choice of what um, data store that they want to use, but then the persistence of the data and the operationalization of that data tier comes back to the infrastructure team. Um, so I'm going to go through this. This looks um, a bit complex, but I'll, I'll walk you through what's happening. And this is how application teams deploy code into a production environment. So you can see the Docker file will go to Bitbucket. Um, the, the Jenkins server will pull an artifact that's already been built from Nexus into the container. Um, so it just, it's just got it in the Docker file to log into Nexus and get the artifact that it needs. Once the, the artifact is in there, it then goes through the build process with security checks, signing that we went through before, and then it does unit tests to make sure that the application is behaving properly. Um, so we're looking for responses into HTTP headers and, and things like that. Um, if it's or API spec returning what, what it should return, um, not that just as a container build. Once that's all done as part of that, it then gets tagged. Um, we don't tag latest. We tag via the build number. And then that gets pushed to the DTR. Um, the reason we don't tag the latest is because if you're debugging something and everything's latest on the machine, when was that actually latest, latest? Um, because you could have done a build, and there's a new build in the DTR that's latest as well. Um, so we do um, use the build, actual build number so we can track what versions are running. And then the Jenkins build server, once it's in the DTR, will then fire off another job, and it will actually talk to the Swarm API, and, and it will deploy a JSON payload with what the container should look like and all the, all the configurable options. And then once that's there, it will then start the container. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more when we go into the, the demo of deploying an application, which is right now. Um, so we're actually going to build, um, we're actually going to deploy something to the um, cluster. Um, so I kind of lied in the talk and said there is going to be no manual steps, but there is one manual step. We're going to assume here that this was a git push and it triggered the job. Um, it would just be take too long for me to push into GitHub, Docker file, build, webhook and come back. So we're just going to assume that we've done that. And we're just going to deploy the container. So as you can see now, it's um, logged into UCP. It's got all its um, certificates, so it can do the TLS handshake. It's just creating the container now. Let's go back here as well. So um, so this is this is the actual job of what it's actually doing. So if you have a look here, you can see that we're we're actually curling to the API with to get an auth token. We're then using getting the bundle so we can talk in TLS. Um, we then are using, creating a docker.json, which is defining all our, all our um, container artifacts. Um, sorry, container configurations. So we're pulling a web app. Um, we're setting the interlock URL. Um, we're saying to bind just port 3,000 to host. Uh, interlock will then route port 80 to 3,000. And then we're going to start the container. OK, cool. So I'll come back to that. We'll just have a look. But as you can see there, it created the container with a hash there, and it started the container. So if we go now, web app dot local, hey, it's all good, and it works. So we can dance. And as you can see then again, if we go to containers on the cluster, you can see that web app ran on 03, 
But no matter where that got scheduled, because I set, because I set the interlock uh, environment variables here, um, it knew where that URL was going, and any HTTP um, request that would come to, the, to interlock would then route it to the right host where that container was running. So this is a very nice way to do um, event-driven service discovery. And you can send those URLs to anything you want. Um, I've just done ucp.local. You could, if you had a domain, you could use your own domain. Um, you can do some really cool stuff with this, where you can write into the build um, to then talk to like Route 53 and update stuff and where it is as well as a part of the build job. Another cool thing that you can do here is you can actually do orchestration. Um, this is a fairly juvenile sort of just to flame one web app. But if you had a multiple stack here with multiple um, JSON. What you can do is, because most of our stuff is um, written in Java, JVMs take some time to come up. Uh, if you've got containers that rely on each other, like an ActiveMQ, for example, um, and the middleware comes up and ActiveMQ is not there, it's going to fail. So you can actually write into this orchestration to create the containers and then orchestrate checks to make sure that the container is up before the next one comes up. So you can write some real smarts into orchestration of your environment. Um, and putting in checks and, ba and balances of what it should look like. So you can imagine where you can take this. Um, it's quite a powerful tool to um, have, the REST API. And of course, if you're a developer that develops, they love JSON and they love REST APIs. Um, so to give them the spec, I just get, literally copy and paste the, the 2.1.2.3 REST API from Docker, their page, and said, guys, here it is, and they built this they were able to build the JSON file with no issues at all. And most of them had very little experience with Docker, but a lot of real experience with JSON and a lot of real experience with um, REST APIs. So it made sense. Whereas before with the UCP cluster, we built that with Puppet, and we deployed those applications with Docker Compose files um, because that made sense for the infrastructure team to do it that way. So as you can see, we're using the right tool for the right job for the right dev team to get the applications out efficiently, repeatably, and with very little risk because this process is repeatable. It's all code. There was no manual intervention. Um, if you want to learn more, I wrote a book about how to build cool stuff with Docker using Puppet. Um, that goes through um, like everything, like Kubernetes, um, everything except Mesos, pretty much. UCP, Swarm, uh, Swarm open source. Um, it starts from very basic, how to build an Nginx application all the way through to scheduling Kubernetes inside Docker UCP, uh, which is cool to do. Um, and I believe Puppet's going to be giving away some copies of this book at 6 o'clock. Um, so if you want a copy, um, Go down there and they'll get it. Um, also, the, all the code that I just did then is on GitHub. And you can take this now and you can build it. Um, all you need to do is go to um, the GCP, get a trial license, um, chuck it into, I'll oh, we'll just go to the instructions. Uh, it is right here. Um, basically, all you need to do is just go to the Docker subscription dot license, chuck in your trial license key there, and then pretty much type Vagrant up. It will build everything for you. Um, so there's, that's the three commands you need to build the whole thing. Um, and then there's the access to where the URLs and, and things are. But yeah, so if you want to play with UCP and start working with the REST API, this is a really good way to um, to start because it's a, a really function, uh, functional, um, well, well put together sort of example. Um, one disclaimer there for work, that is, this is not production code for HealthDirect. Uh, that's why I could open source it. Um, and we use similar sort of stuff, but you can imagine it's not, this is not production code. Um, yeah. Um, and thank you. That's. Um, so, any questions? Will this work? It will work on Windows if you got Vagrant installed. Because it, will, it actually is on the Ubuntu cluster. It will build a Ubuntu cluster. Any other questions? Oh, yep.
how do we manage the state in S3? Yeah, so we, off, we offload the state file, and then when Terraform comes up, it's got um, permission to talk to the S3 bucket. So every time it comes up, we move the state away. Um, so we've got checks and balances written into the build, um, the build pipeline. So we do a Terraform um, plan first to see if anything's going to break. Uh, if, as, if a resource is going to um, get destroyed, we actually fail the build, and someone has to manually look because you don't want to just destroy stuff. Um, and then if it goes through um, there, we do checks and balances to make sure everything passed in the Jenkins log. And then if not, it will start to um, remove what it's created. Um, yeah, so the question was, do we use um, Terraform all the time? Um, we do use it a lot. Um, we do spin up environments. Um, we try to do blue-green um, dev environment. So that's why like, I was able to spin this environment up so quickly. Um, this was an example of just like a small pod that we would give a developer. And as I said, it sets up all the application routing. They've got a key value store and a build server. So yeah, we would use Terraform a fair bit. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, no, interlocks still need it because if you, um, I've been playing with this for a couple of days now. I actually wanted to try to demo Swarm Kit today, but it was, it was too soon. And I only got in from Sydney two days ago and I was jet lag. I, I tried, I did try my best. Um, so, what happens with interlock now is if you have VIPs and you have your overlay network and you have multiple um, like services um, that you don't want to expose. Um, publicly, it'll open up to port 30,000 by default. You point interlock at, to listen to that, and then any HTTP header that comes through that is undifferent will then route, yeah, will route it in. Um, because Swarm natively doesn't, like the new Swarm stuff with the VIP um, doesn't natively do HTTP or, or care about that, and it shouldn't, it's not its job. Um, but if you want to run multiple web services on like the same port in the overlay network, you need something to do that, that proxying and that routing, so interlock won't be superseded, I don't think. But it's very early days, but I'm, I don't think it will. That's my opinion. And, and yeah, yes? Um, yeah, the, it just made sense to um, expose the, it made more sense to do the, do, for two reasons it made more sense to us. One, the, the developer um, actually builds their JSON, their JSON file. Um, and then we give them the power to build their applications. We build the orchestration framework for them. Um, if they were going to do, um, if we we're going to like SSH into the box with Jenkins and do Docker, PS, or whatever, that would be something that we would be more responsible about writing. And we're trying to empower the developers to be able to have as much power as they do, as they need to de um, deploy their own applications. Um, so we're trying to just de decouple that way. Um, so that's why we went down this path. And it made sense, as I said before, because they really, developers understand REST API. They understand JSON. I was able to send through just the spec of the API, and they were able to start building straight away. So. Yeah, so everything goes through that process. So um, it's just a whole heap of stuff we've written in Golang. So um, it just looks at the TF file. Um, it then looks, it does the Terraform plan. It then sees what's going to be changed. Uh, if something's going to be destroyed, the build fails. If not, it'll go through and build it. And then we'll, we've got a, an application sitting below Terraform, if you will, that's written in Go that just passes the logs and looks for like stuff. Uh, if it doesn't find anything that's vicious, it just does it. And, No, that's not open source, no. We're not allowed to open source that, sorry. 
2.0. Yeah, so that's the latest. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I wanted to use the latest version of Jenkins because I know it's just come out, so yeah. Um, yeah, we, we've orchestrated all that. Um, so there's a PR progress for the, um, for the Docker file. So someone's looked at it and said, yep, that's cool. And that's gone in. And then Jenkins goes through um, like quality gates, and we automate all that. Um, so there's no manual sign-off. It's all automated quality gates. So like um, security vulnerability scanning will be one quality gate. The unit test for the application will be another quality gate, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, so we've got one of the, the different signages for different environments for, with Notary, like different certs, but this, the process is the same, yes. Yeah, so you could um, just pause the build till someone logs in with authorization and goes, yeah, that's okay. You can build that. Um, you could probably build something that sits around the Jenkins REST API, like a form. The people will go, get, oh, you got an email, and then, OK, I approve, and then it goes back, and yeah, you could write that. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. Um, no, not really. It was, it was pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, it was pretty straightforward. So we didn't try to migrate any of our old jobs. Um, what we actually did was, like, um, because we had our Jenkins server before built with Puppet, um, and then when we needed to farm that out to um, other teams that don't know Puppet, there's a whole d dependency on hire and a whole heap of things. It didn't work for a dev team, so we moved it into Docker and used the job DSL plugin, um, and that's what automated the deploy job. So we just re-automated our jobs and then kind of cut across to a fresh version of Jenkins and made it heaps cleaner. Um, yeah, I don't know if you upgrade if there's stuff. Yeah, I didn't, I, we didn't do that. We thought that there could be a heartache, so we just went migrate to the new one. Um, no, um, the, team, the question was, oh, sorry, I've got to repeat the question if it's not on mic. Um, do, we, we have, um, do we have multiple Jenkins servers? And that we do. Um, they all can talk to each other, and there's downstream, upstream. Um, but yeah, we split it out, decentralized it. So the product team um, would have their own build server. Yeah, yeah, they, they can all interact. Um, oh, we can scale. Um, so we find that if you run the build, so if you, if we have like the infrastructure as a code team, we have three slave nodes, um, and we run multiple containers, and you can get really good performance about doing a build in a container, kill it, another container, kill it, across, and schedule that across all three. Um, we don't really get into an auto scaling sort of um, provisioning issue. We we very rarely. Yeah, yeah. No, um, so the master's a container as well, and there's there's a cluster of three EC2 instances, and then the master triggers a build build from the Docker agent on the EC2 instance across the three instances. Yeah, so they're all everything's in a container, and they're in rolling containers. Um, it, it gives you flexibility and scale at a massive massive amount, and yeah, and the. Like the multiple Jenkins servers talk to each other because like you don't want to double up on your Claire and your Notary infrastructure, and it's not um, it's not that easy to set up. So you don't want to be farming that out everywhere. Um, so like for example, the infrastructure build server has Claire and Notary. Um, so when an application build server is going to deploy a container, it'll actually do a upstream call from Jenkins to Jenkins to trigger it. Um, so we're not reproducing a whole heap of stuff everywhere. Um, there is some logic about what runs where. Uh, what do you mean versioning of Jenkins jobs? Um, so the C jobs looks after that. So if you build a C job with the job DSL, it puts it in a desired state, and that runs every two minutes. And if someone's changed it, it'll change back. Uh, 
Um, so we only do that via code. And the Groovy scripts are all source controlled. Um, so that it'll go through the PR requests, and then it'll get merged, and then into Jenkins, and then update itself. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So everything's done with the git commit. No one logs into anything. Yeah. Uh, yep. I, I personally think it is because it, it's in Golang. So Golang is a lot easier to write than JSON. Um, and yeah, I, I, would, I would do it. We, we used to use CloudFormation back in the day. And like the, the nesting of stuff and that, it gets really messy. And you have to upload it to AWS and stuff. Um, it seems easier to just do it. Yeah. Yeah, we're auto-generating Terraform with a, an application we wrote in GoLink. So it's just a GoLink command line app that um, just asks you a few questions. Um, what do you want to build? Um, then submits a pull request on your behalf. Someone sh and then builds it for you, and then away it goes. Um, so it's a very simple process for someone just to do a command line. Yeah. 